having derived the proper strain tensor uh, epsilon ij with rotation removed. We'll now uh, just discuss um, a few uh, tensor properties for strain. Uh, pretty straightforward. This will be a fairly short lecture just to um, give you some special meanings of, of certain things. And some of it's uh, analogous to the stress tensor that we discussed previously. So um, just like the stress tensor, we'll have very useful and unique forms of the um, of of the strain tensor. Remember, we had something that is near and dear to my heart in my film of thin films, where we had sigmas here before when we talk about stress and it was biaxial stress, right? Well, of course, strain. There's many problems where we only have these two components here if we uh, orient the axes correctly. And so this is called plane strain. And so you only have um, strain deformation in, in two dimensions. So it's like pulling a sheet, essentially. And you have distortion only uh, in uh, two directions. There's no shearing stress at all. And of course, uh, sorry, shearing strain. And then uh, you can have the same thing we had in the stress case where we have the opposite sign here. And if you rotate that 45 degrees, you would find out that this is a state of pure shear. And now this is easy to see, by the way, why you want to take the rotation out. Because in a state of pure shear strain, in a state of pure shear strain, if I had rotation in here, you can clearly see the elements you'd have in here and here would completely distort uh, what the real values of strain from materials perspective are. Because, of course, some of that would just be the rotation of, of the body. Now, there's a very important part. Um, and purpose to diagonalizing a, um, and it doesn't really matter if you have all three, the point is to diagonalize it even if some of these are zero. Uh, the reason is that a lot of times when you're looking at energy or other properties and you've applied stress uh, and you've distorted this thing, uh, one of the problems is, hmm, uh, what is the real volume change? And of course, in thin films and like this, you see this all the time, right? So you'd like to know what the volume change is. And it turns out that the trace of this diagonalized strain tensor uh, is the change in volume. So that's a very convenient, uh, a very convenient uh, property of the strain tensor. So let me just um, prove that to you very quickly. And I have a cube. Yes, this should be a cube. A cube sitting here. And if I have L1, L2, and L3, let's imagine that body there. Then the volume, of course, is L1, L2, L3. And if I look at the change in volume plus the volume after a deformation process, it's going to be L1 times 1 plus so on 1, 1 times L2 times 1 plus epsilon 2, 2 times L3, 1 plus epsilon 3, 3. So if you look at this, this makes perfect sense. We all know that once we have strain without rotation, typical way we use it is 1 plus epsilon times the original length gives us the length, right? So this is just saying I have V. Originally, I'm distorting it. I'm adding some volume by, or subtracting some volume, whatever, by uh, causing deformation strain on it, and uh, it deforms it. And you end up with, and again, deforming it, when we use the word here, we're talking about elastic deformation, right? And uh, these are just the changes in the three 
uh, links. So of course when you multiply that out, you're going to see that it's L1, L2, L3 plus all the terms that we have here. Right, this term, this term, this term in there. And therefore, I can now write with this L1, L2, L3 out front, I can say that I have, where I have not multiplied all this out, and I have not done here on the screen what I've done here, which is I threw out the higher order terms. Because again, if we assume that the deformation, the the strain, the small displacements, I can throw out higher order terms because little tiny delta u's squared or cubed uh, disappear, right? And so we end up with this, which is essentially uh, just uh, defining v uh, plus delta v where delta v is 1, oh, sorry, is just the trace right here, epsilon 1, 1 plus epsilon 2, 2 plus epsilon 3, 3. And so that's a very uh, useful property uh, to determine uh, when you're trying to do some absolute things and you need to know, hey, how much did the volume actually change uh, during this process? It's a cute little trick. You can diagonalize the strain tensor and then find out the volume change. Last word on strain tensor properties is that it's a field tensor like sigma ij. So it's not representing, you know, some fixed property there uh, in a sense because you're, you take... Um, you know, stress, and you apply it, and remember that's a field tensor. And there's certain properties of the crystal, which, as we'll find out later, Cijkl, and then I end up with epsilon, and epsilon can be anything. You know, it's the response essentially of uh, sigma, and so it's a field tensor. Uh, so again. Uh, C, uh, sigma ij would be a field tensor that is a generalized force and then epsilon ij is a, a field tensor that's a generalized displacement.